When we visit SeaWorld, we tend to take for granted the fact that Shamu has been provided with a safe and comfortable habitat. And everything trained is an extension of the killer whale's natural behavior. I spewed out the party line during shows. I'm totally mortified now. There's like something like, look at Namu. You know, Namu's not doing that because she has to. Namu is doing this because she really wants to. Oh my gosh. Like some of the things I'm embarrassed by, so embarrassed by. At the time, I think I could have convinced myself that the relationships that we had were built on something stronger than the fact that I'm giving them fish. You know, I like to think that, <laughs> uh, but I don't know that that's the truth. I had been there a while and I had seen a, a, a few other things along the way that made me question uh, why I was there and what we were doing with these animals. On November 4th, 1988, a killer whale at SeaWorld gave the performance of a lifetime. Don't miss this small miracle. Come see our new baby Shamu. I know it was naive of me, but I thought that <laughs> it was our responsibility to do as much as we could to keep their family units together, since we knew that in the wild that's what happens. Yes, sir, that's our baby. What Kalina was the first baby Shamu. Baby Shamu, SeaWorld's newest star. Don't she had become quite disruptive uh, in challenging her mom a little bit and disrupting some shows and that kind of thing. She's got the whole place jumping, Shamu. She's our baby whale. It was decided by the higher-ups that she would be moved to another park when she was just four, four and a half years old. And that was uh, news to us as trainers that were working with her. To me, it had never crossed my mind that they might be moving the baby from her mom. The supervisors um, basically was kind of mocking me, like, oh, you're saying poor Kalina? You know, what's she going to do without her mommy? And, you know, and that, of course, just shut me up. <laughs> so the night of the move, we had to deploy the nets to separate them and get Kalina, the baby, into the med pool. And Katina was, was generally a quiet whale. She was not an uh, overly vocal whale. Um, after Kalina was removed from the scene um, and put on the truck and taken to the airport and Katina, her mom, was left in the pool. She stayed in the corner of the pool, um, like literally just shaking and screaming, screeching, crying. Like um, I'd never seen her do anything like that. Um, and the other females in the pool, maybe once or twice during the night, they'd come out and check on her, and she'd screech and cry, and they would just run back. There was nothing that you could call that watching it besides grief. Those are not your whales. You know, you love them, and you think, I'm the one that touches them, feeds them, keeps them alive, gives them the care that they need. They're not your whales. They own them. Kazaka and Takara were very close. Kazaka was the mother. Takara's the calf. Takara was special to me. They were inseparable. When they separated Kazaka and Takara, it was to take Takara to Florida. Once Takara had already been stretchered out of the pool, put on the truck, driven to the airport, Kasaka continued to make vocals that had never been heard before. They brought in the senior research scientists to analyze the vocals. They were long range vocals. She was trying something that no one had even heard before, looking for Takara. That's heartbreaking. How can anyone look at that and think that that is morally acceptable. It's not. It is not okay. <laughs>